Hey, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studio. Uh, we've got a, a fun episode of Security Matters today, and I am sorry I have been offline. Most of October, I was traveling, um, so I'm happy to be back here today. Um, and Jenny Vickers is with me. I'm, she is the CEO of Zeppard Law. I'm going to let her do her intro as I normally do, uh, but stick around. We're going to have some fun talking about it. And I've got, she's an international guest coming to us from New Zealand. Um, so, Jenny, I appreciate you getting up early in the morning uh, or it's a little bit earlier than it is here, but it's already tomorrow there, I believe, as well. So anyway, uh, thank you. Go ahead and um, let our audience know if, if they haven't read about you and IFSEC for your um, your number one global influencer award and your nomination to the, the best of the best award that we'll talk about. Um, give, them, give them a sense of the background. You know, I know we don't give it all away on social media today, but as much as you'd care to share uh, and let us know, um, have at it. And thank you for joining me today. So, hi, Andrew, and good morning from New Zealand on uh, Wednesday. And uh, I'm delighted to be here and to have this opportunity to have a bit of a chat. So, um, so kicking off with uh, me, I, I love being a New Zealander. I've lived here for 25 years. I emigrated here from the UK. And I still remember the emotional feeling I had going through citizenship ceremony and that sense of belonging in a place, which also made reminded me of why don't we do citizenship ceremonies for people who are born somewhere so that they get that same sense of anchoring to the place. But when I stepped off the plane 25 years ago, I knew that this was the place I was supposed to be. So, um, so it's a cool place. So I, I have a very unconventional career, although I'm not sure whether these days there's any such thing as a conventional one. Um, so maybe it's the serial development. And so often I describe to people that what I do is anything I find really interesting um, and I'll go off in a different direction. And over the last couple of weeks, I was thinking about a number of the businesses I've developed, uh, which I've parked, which... Had I done something with them 10 years ago, then I'd probably be a billionaire now. But actually, it was more important to move on to the next thing that got me excited and interested. So, um, so these days, I run Zepard Law. So it's my own law firm. And I'll tell you a little bit about the Zepard in a second. Uh, at the moment, I'm on one contract. So my law firm's got one uh, client and I'm working with Fortinet, which I'm loving. Great company, very strong, ethical, underpin, fabulous products. And so from my uh, years as a lawyer, uh, working in an ethical environment is so important. So it's a ha happy, comfortable space to be. And uh, so the Zeppard, I should explain to people about the Zeppard. So I was looking for, uh, I was teaching mind mapping. I'd stopped being a lawyer and so I'd had enough of being a lawyer and uh, discovered mind mapping and wanted to help lawyers be a bit more visionary with their thinking because often I was finding myself as the only person in a room who could see this while everybody else was pinned down on the page. So I discovered mind mapping, uh, thought this is a fabulous thing to do. Then I needed a brand name and the Zeppard appeared from a brainstorming session with uh, a fabulous friend from Aussie and the two of us bounced ideas around and so we ended up with this hybrid of a zebra and a leopard and it's really interesting that it, it was the perfect for me of whole brain thinking you've got to be a bit left you've got to be a bit right um, and then I started researching into zebras and leopards and love the fact that success comes from being able to uh, be a team player to be an individual to be able to um, think differently to be able to work together people to to collaborate and to influence their thinking so so the zeppa as my brand is the perfect encapsulation of me and the color i use orange uh, which is a very strong powerful happy positive color so over the last um and this is what led to the fset global nomination over the last five to eight years, I've been involved very closely with defence in both Australia and New Zealand. I'm very much working in the contract commercial management space and looking at how do we get government customers and industry working better together, because there's far too many examples in the world of uh, all that focus. And again, this is where we're back to the lawyers. You have all this focus on getting a contract in place, but 
unless you manage your behaviors and the relationship before the contract signed, uh, then the chance of making that relationship carry on afterwards um, is gonna be tainted if you haven't got it right. And, um, and finally, those examples take me back to uh, practicing law in the UK and doing M&A transactions, which I used to do. And often I'd be acting for the, um, the selling business. So maybe a baby boomer who was ready to sell their business to one of the big guys and I'd look after them and uh, we'd do the contract. But often you could see that anxiety and angst between the lawyers that by the time the contract was signed, somebody wasn't even talking, the parties weren't even talking to each other. Wow. That's not the lawyer's job. Uh, but in the zealousness to uh, defend and uh, risk and make sure that their client doesn't take on too risk, the big picture and the long-term relationships get lost. So, um, <laughs> so, so that's me. And then defense sector is a fascinating sector. In New Zealand, it's particularly interesting because we spend an awful lot more here on uh, domestic products, um, on clothes, on food, um, than we do on anything that's at the big end. And, um, and so there's uh, you know, thousands of companies supply defense here and important for all of them to have a good relationship. We wanna see great, um, good value purchasing by government. We also need to see successful thriving local businesses. So, hmm. so being part of that mix and trying to make sure that we move everybody in the right direction together is really important. So that's me. Wow. No, I, I love it. I love what I love about especially defense work, right, which is a, a sector I'm in in the U.S. You know, when you've got leopards who are pretty much singular, right, they've got their spots, they hide out in the terrain. But then you've got the zebras who all hide out together so that, you know, only the slow and the old get picked off, right, when they all have to run from as prey. Uh, so they yeah. kind of hide amongst their stripes. So interesting. Um, when I was in um, New Zealand, I did observe and, and talk to a lot of folks who absolutely sort of self subsistence is almost a, a, a sense of a source of national pride there. I think so much of, of, of what goes on in New Zealand is built in and around what New Zealand can make themselves, deliver themselves, and uh, then supply to themselves. There's not a lot of import, maybe automobiles or something, but they're, you know, they're very self sufficient. Is that um, sort of one of those things that? that uh, exists also in that defense space in your experience? So I think in theory, yes, in practice, probably no. So I think interestingly, and so uh, I don't mean to beat up on procurement people, but it often sounds like I am, but some of them <laughs> deserve it. Some of them deserve it and the exemplars need to be encouraged. But I think um, if you track through what's happened here, it's been very similar from around the world. The, Government procurement and saving money, cheapest price, blah, 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 all of that good stuff that never worked, um, was, was a guide for a long time. And so for over time, more of, and this is right the way across the government, um, more and more products would be supplied from overseas because our local, um, you know, we don't have the economies of scale that other countries have. Sure. And so often our local suppliers um, would get beaten on because that lower price. And, and so we had a change in procurement rules maybe eight to 10 years ago where it became value for money. But what we saw was people going blah, blah, blah value, cheapest price. And it was just, you know, it just became a new word to being cheapest price. So we actually got nowhere with it. Over the past two, and it's actually two years since they were launched, we've had this greater interest from government in broader outcomes and saying, how do we actually make sure that more of our uh, local businesses get to see um, the government spend because we should be able to do better, but they, are, they needed to have a broader perspective. Now, it's been a long, slow process. Uh, some of the articles I've written, in fact, there was one I wrote in Line of Defence magazine, which was in there a couple of months ago, and I did a report card on progress with broader outcomes. Um, and I think I gave them a C, must try harder. But frankly, to be honest, when I wrote the article, it said D, must try harder. And then I thought, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a bit too brutal because we do need to encourage the good ones. So, so I gave them a quick remark and put them up to the C 
Uh, but if you ask my mother, C's not good enough. So, um, so <laughs> C's not good enough yet. So, so we are seeing some changes here. But one of the other things which is really interesting is that we have all these amazing tech companies in New Zealand who only supply overseas. So, you know, we're famous all over the place. People here won't even know the names of the companies. You know, we have people employing 50 to 100 people who do no domestic work at all because oh. they would create a new product, uh, talk to the world. world would go, yep, yeah, we want this. Venture capital money come in from overseas and their oh. entire focus has been outside. Now, I guess for those guys, a long-term success would be actually getting to be supplying to New Zealand as well. So, um, sure. so then you get to COVID. And so we've got broader outcomes running as a new concept before COVID hit. And that suddenly gave us the, the very compelling evidence for why having more local supply and strengthened supply chains with your local suppliers made perfect sense. But of course, you can't fix it. Uh, the minute the borders close, it's not so easy. But there were some there were some great examples. So one of my favorites was uh, the NZ Sock Company. So um, and one of the things they they have are ballistic socks. Um, and so they they do remarkable work with New Zealand wool um, that they could make these high performance tech, technologically advanced socks. Um, but they um, I chatted to them early on in COVID. They needed a bit of tooling done so that they could then switch their machines from socks to masks. And, um, oh. and so you know New Zealand business the one uh, we do have tooling expertise, but it's you know the easy lazy thing is to send it to china um mm. they got everything done off they went started um making masks and i haven't spoken to them for ages but it was a that was a nice example of we do have the expertise but we actually need to make sure that we have pro procurement people who are enabled and able and willing to buy local yeah i think the u.s has seen that same reliance that we had i mean your vision for what needs to be done, you know, long term for better outcomes. The US got bit as well. Uh, a lot of our resourcing being done offshore, chipsets in things that we're selling to the defense sector, to a critical infrastructure sector, now a big problem. So we see Intel gearing up, going to build new chip plants, but all this stuff takes years to fix. You know, yeah. that the pivot, the pivot back to local consumption by local manufacturing, keeping all the tax dollars here, the earnings here, all that stuff's a it isn't unknown, but it's definitely a change of mindset that's been, you know, offshore, 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 cheaper, cheaper, you know, to your point. Um, so it, it, I think it's, it's good vision on your part to, to continue to push that line and the CD grade, uh, I think the U S would have an F right now, actually. Uh, so the, the CD grade is, is actually perhaps gentle, but you know, don't stop pushing. That's all because you don't want to end up where we were. Um, it's it's um it's a difficult position um and especially defense which moves you know slowly right it's a big industry um so i did have an opportunity to visit with one of our security superstars that is big in new zealand and around the world and that's gallagher security um down there in hamilton i don't think too far away from you um have you ever have you yeah, Sir William's a, a, a gentleman of one. A, he's a yeah. knight, you know, he's knighted now, Sir yeah. William. So he's an amazing guy. Um, have you had an opportunity to interact with that group at, at all in your uh, business dealings? Yes, no, I, I definitely do. In my previous role with Defence Industry Association, I uh, went and visited um, Gallagher's. And actually, one of the things that struck me about them was that they I did a tour of the whole factory and operations. And one of the things that was so interesting was that they're geared up for the whole spectrum from robotification. Um, and I was looking at the, um, we're doing injection molding, all robot driven. And then they had people in other parts of the factory doing hand construction and um, artisan work because that particular product needed the artisan and another product needed the robot. And so they've got the ability to do the whole range. And uh, so William uh, is delightful. Every time I get a chance to meet with him, it's always a pleasure. Yeah, like, uh, one of these, um, I was, when I got down there, and it's been quite a, maybe a decade ago, but an absolutely brilliant company. I mean, I thought, 
from the way they were so internally resourced. You know, here's a model that I wish we had available in the U.S. for other security products that were sold in the U.S. at the time. So it was a it was a refreshing and and wonderful to see what they were doing. Yeah. Well, we um, we have been chatting like already halfway through. So let, <laughs> we're going to jump to a break real quick for one minute. So come, we'll be back in a minute. Stick around. We'll be talking with Jenny Vickers when we get back. Good afternoon. This is Howard Wig, the proud host of Code Green, a Think Tech Hawaii program. We air every other Monday from noon to 1230. And my guests are subject matter experts in bringing Hawaii to 100% clean energy by 2045. And we're aiming not just at the electricity, but also at ground transportation. Exciting stuff. Please join me. Hey, thanks for hanging around. We're talking with Jenny Vickers. She is live with us from New Zealand today. Um, Jenny, your background's been amazing. And I know that you are, are now kind of working with Fortinet. So let's give them a little bit of love. How's it been to join a new relationship kind of during COVID and I'm not sure if you're doing BD or sales, how that's working out, but, uh, you know, a huge name in the industry. I'm a Fortinet user myself, a big fan of their products. Um, what's it been like to engage with an organization like that and help them, you know, share their love during, you know, COVID, you know, with the impacts of business down there? Yeah, so thank you. And uh, the Ford, Fortinet is a great company. And I think I said at the very beginning that um, that highly ethical um, drive for a business is so important for me because I have in my career in the past been in a few places where you sit and look at the ethical dilemmas dilemmas and the behaviors of some people and it's like no I don't want to be there again because it's a stressful and exhausting place to be and uh, you can manage your own ethics you can't always manage those of other people so uh, sure. so great company so they one of the things I've been looking at particularly was um, what the corporate social responsibility projects might look like. So um, Jay Garcia is very well known to people in, Aust in uh, the US and around the world. So he's a, a former Marine and he heads up the Veteran 40 Vet program um, for Fortinet. And so the, there's a chronic shortage of cybersecurity professionals around the world and um, we need to do something about it. So Fortinet has made a pledge to, to contribute a million more uh, people into the cyber workforce. So I've been looking at what can we do here and spending a lot of time talking to Australia as well around how they're using uh, Fortinet training to support veterans to go into industry. So, um, so that's taken a lot of my time. Um, we're seeing a lot of change in New Zealand in the last couple of years in the way we uh, look at tertiary education. So how do we make sure that we don't put people through university and then spit them out the other end with very high student loans and no jobs because <laughs> they're not anchored to the workplace? Yeah, so no, it's a problem. Yeah, so a massive transformation. The tech sector here has done a great job um, of being part of that process. Um, and one of the interesting findings from their recent research was that we have a skills mismatch in technology, not necessarily... A shortage of people so um, we still have people and so and I've been looking recently um, about how many people are coming out of university with web design skills or with app development or some of the things where the demand is actually in security and you know security jobs are so broad and so wide um, and I think the area of I think of interest to you is is we need to get that better convergence between uh, OT, IT, mm -hmm physical yeah. security um, and cyber security. And uh, I did notice, I'm gonna quick shout out to the fabulous Nairi Kelleher, who uh, is uh, one of the except global influencers um, this year. And uh, she is an ACES chairman here in New Zealand. And I noticed the other day, she was about to start studying 
um, that convergence of physical security and cybersecurity. So I'm looking forward to seeing a lot more in that space. And it's it's a, an area that Fortinet are very passionate about too. So, yeah, and I, I love that commitment to training a million people. You know, Microsoft, I think, committed to 250,000. So if, if Fortinet's going for a million, that's that's a, they're not on Microsoft scale, that's for sure. So that's yeah. a, a really good, and maybe it was 250 million. I could be misquoting there, but I think it was 250,000. But that's, that is a, a worthwhile endeavor, and it, we need it all across all yeah. across the planet. So, I mean, and Fortinet's a global company, right? So they should be able to be an influencer there in, in all the market spaces and be able to help out. That's that's incredible. Um, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about IFSEC. So IFSEC Global Influencer, you've got the number one in your category. Uh, th uh, congratulations, you know, first Thank of all you. for that. It's a, there were, I think there were like 20 in each category. So, you know, getting the number one wasn't easy. This is a sort of an interesting and, and a difficult accomplishment. Um, what, um, what does influencer, what does that role sort of mean to you? What do you think about it? Cause, uh, you know, we were talking off camera a little bit about that. It's not like a TikTok influencer per se, no. right? We're <laughs> security influencers. We feel, uh, passionately about protecting people, protecting assets and, and, you know, national defense, all these types of, of constructs. So we're, we're, I hope we're a different influencer than a TikTok influencer personally. Um, but give us, give us your, your take on uh, that influencer role and, um, you know, how, how you help to, uh, you know, fulfill, you know, what, um, what, it, what it meant to you or how, you, you know, when you got it, what all the things that you've done that you thought, uh, Hey, oh, this must be why I finally got some recognition, you know, or whatever. Yeah. So, um, so I mentioned before that I grew up in the UK. My uh, uh, amazing, fabulous mother was the uh, headmistress of a school for handicapped children for a very long time. And she did a whole number of firsts um, in her role as headmistress around supporting um, disabled children to give them better quality of life. And I think one of the things I learned from her very early on is the pleasure you get personally from supporting other people and helping them. So in her role, uh, long before social media, her job was to connect the people with the money, with the cause. And so I think I learned um, those skill sets from watching my mum and wow. the, the benefits you get from being part of that supportive community, but also being able to do that within the commercial world. So for me, influencing is really about helping connect people together um, so that the right people are talking because uh, I'm mm. so over all the conversations about silos and stovepipes and um, blah, blah, blah. And it's really, you know, what can we do together? Although I must tell you a very quick story, which I read in a, a post a number of years ago about silos. And uh, we talk about, you know, people in silos, but actually somebody did the research and silos are designed with air holes to keep the grain fresh. And therefore, the whole point of a silo is it's designed to let things flow through. Ah, and so okay. it's a bit like my zeppard. The zeppard, ne uh, the leopard, never changes its spots. Is also the opposite of what is actually true, um, and from where the story came from. Anyway, that was a small diversion that I needed to share. But anyway, so for me, influencing is about connecting and um, making a difference to people because the more people I know. That means that gives me the chance to amplify to more people, but for their benefit, not mine. So, um, so that's what influencing means for me. And that was what I got to do in my defense industry role was to um, connect into as many, connect as many businesses in with defense as I possibly could. And a lot of my early successes were all around connecting businesses with businesses. So we have, mm. Um, some of the amazing tech companies, amazing manufacturers, you know, government procurement cycles, particularly in the defense sector, are long. Um, industry needs cash, it needs uh, money on the door. Um, and so the company to company collaborations were those which we were starting to see. And, and now I'm not in the defense industry role anymore. I'm still connected with all of those people and I'm daily delighted when I see that one of them's got a defense contract or they've um, moved on with the next stage, because um, I would keep saying it's a long game. It's a long game and you need to be um, playing in the, I've, I'm no good at uh, team sports, so I can't use any of those analogies, but the fact <laughs> is, you know, if you're playing a long game, you need to be dancing in the background um, while you're waiting. 
Sorry. Yeah, I, I think it, I think influencing is a team sport. I mean, obviously you're you're sort of in the middle of all those teams. You're like, oh, do you know about this team over here? Did you know that they do that? And so that that putting together people is a is a it's a it's a really a critical function. I think in in any industry, whether it be national defense in the commercial in a, any geo environment, you know, cities, towns, there's these folks that seem to kind of have their finger on the pulse at all different levels of of things that are happening and they just happen to know people so you know tying those things you know up and down across those silos you know three silos over from the bottom yeah. to the top and it's amazing what happens you know i, I um i, I love just i like introducing people and some watching them just have do amazing things i, I think that just helps us all you know it's yeah. a good thing that you're doing down there is the um is the community large so the the uh, the influencer award is obviously prestigious. Have you gotten a lot of feedback from the communities that you work in down there? That you know, because I'm not, I'm sure everybody's online, so they probably see it online. But we're you're, we're not able to get the benefit of being out in public with a big banner hanging behind, just going number one influencer, you know, and and drawing yeah. people to a, a venue, you know, a stage or whatever it may be. Um, so how's how's the reaction been uh, amongst your community there? Uh, probably. Um larger more reaction amongst my global community rather than the local um the although the physical security community in new zealand um are you know this is their their space and so with the physical security guys um lots of attention uh in the defense and national security only gradual awareness of it but you know the awards have to become they have to go through their own transition so big in the world eventually it'll arrive in new zealand so um but it's been it's been a fabulous experience being named and for me the benefit of being named at that number one spot for thought leadership was how can i use that to support other people so um and and that's the benefit that comes to me so one of one of the the ones to watch winners uh from new zealand was ankita decker and uh, she also, by chance, lives not far from Gallagher's. And, um, and so she and I have been, been engaging quite a lot. So, and I'm introducing her to people. Um, she's a cybersecurity uh, ninja evangelist, looking at helping uh, younger people stay safe um, in the cyber community. So absolutely somebody we need to be supporting. Um, and so if I get to use my influence to support younger people, then that gives me really good. Um, ah, good I love that. Isn't yeah. it even so much better? Yeah. It's even so much better. I love, I love your work. I love what you're doing down there. Um, it's a shame we're not going to get to meet in London, but I'm definitely going to get back down to New Zealand uh, soon so we can, uh, can meet in person, have a cup of tea. Um, yeah. The... Um, so we've got 30 seconds or so left. Uh, just a closing thought maybe on, um, uh, on anything you'd like to say to share with our audience today. Yeah, so I think uh, I would say buy New Zealand, uh, buy our products, um, have a look at what we're doing. Um, we have massive companies. We also have tiny companies. But um, for most of the things we make here and do here, uh, we do it with love and with as much caring as we can possibly inject into a product. So um, so I'd say buy New Zealand products and help us get out of lockdown because it's uh, a bit lonely. When when your company is at mannequins, it's time to get out. <laughs> so. <laughs> I hope you get out soon. I hope you guys get out of lockdown soon. Jenny, I truly appreciate you being with us today. Buy New Zealand, folks. You heard it here today. Aloha, everybody, Bye. and take care Bye. out there. Bye.